<coughs> remain standing uh, as we join together in our churches, our statement of faith. The United Church of Christ is not a creedal church, but we certainly have a statement of faith. And I would like that you would join with me in our statement of faith, please. We believe in you, O God, eternal Spirit, God of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our God. And to your deeds we testify. You call the worlds into being, create persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. You call us into your church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto you. You may be seated. Hear now the scripture for today. Thank you. Good morning, all. Our scripture today is from John 20, uh, verses 19 through 23. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you, are, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Amen. This is the book from John 20, verses 24 to 31. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. <clears throat> it's a real privilege to preach wherever I preach, but especially here. This is a special congregation that means so much to Linda and me. And become a part of you and being able to share God's word with you has always been, for me, a very meaningful experience. It's very awesome, but it's also very humbling. To fall, follow after Barton is really a big act to follow. So I'll do the best I can, and for those of you who are visitors, come back again when Barton's here. Get the whole thing. 
The scriptures we heard this morning, or the one scripture that's two parts, is really, and I want to thank Bob and Kathy for reading that scripture, it's really an interesting passage because it's probably written 60, 70 years after the actual events, but it records how they were remembering so many wonderful things that happened when they were with Jesus. I mean, they had those old memories that were still fresh in their mind, just like they happened yesterday. You know, when they sat at the Sermon on the Mount, when they saw the various miracle, miracles performed, when they were present to see Lazarus being raised from the dead, when they uh, went to Jerusalem and went through that wonderful triumphal entry. You know one of the things I like about that? Jesus told his disciples to go get a donkey. Always makes me feel good, like Jesus will always choose jackasses. <laughs> you know, it's one of the things that also excites me is that that whole experience of going there being so high and then crashing like it did with the trial and all those kinds of things. But in, in the middle of that was this wonderful time when they gathered together for the celebration of the Passover. And when they sang, when they instituted this Passover, celebrated it, Jesus instituted something new, something that we're going to do a little later, a few moments. He instituted the Holy Communion, or the Eucharist, as we might call it. And then we forget sometimes that when they had done this, they sang a hymn and then went out to the Mount of Olives for the Garden of Gethsemane and the prayers and then the trial and all of that and the crucifixion. And now there are these reports about Jesus being alive. Well, like a lot of skeptical men, you just don't trust the word of a bunch of women. You've got to see it for yourself. So here they were, huddled up, hiding because they were afraid of their own friends, the Jews, not foreigners, but their own friends. They were terrified of their Jews. And they were locked up in this room that we call the upper room. There they were, terrified, not able to sing a note. This was not a hymn sing, you know. This was terror at its top level. And Jesus appeared to them. He had other choices, you know. Oh, I, if I would have read this, wrote the script, I would have had him going into the temple and meeting Caiaphas, the high priest, and say, ha ha, look who's here! <laughs> or showing up at Pilate's door for, guess who's coming for breakfast? <laughs> you know, but no, he knew where the need was greatest and that was the people who tried to follow him. Those were the people whose passion had waned. And he realized how much his passion for them mattered. And so he shows up to be where the need was greatest. He always does that, you know. But you know, the neat thing about it was, even though the door was locked, that didn't keep him from appearing. It, he didn't unlock the door. He never uses forced entry. He does not use power and force to reach people. And he comes in. The door is still locked. And as the scripture says, he joined them where they were. He joins us where we are, even in the midst of our worst terrors and fears. And he says... Peace. It's actually Shalom Alechem in Hebrew, which means not just peace from the sense of absence of war, but wholeness of life. Peace be with you. Can't you start to hear the hum? We're going to start to sing again. That's what the disciples were feeling. It's coming back. They were beginning to feel that joy restored to them. And then he <laughs> breathes on them. And he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. Nancy, come up and join me, would you? Nancy's been doing some review and prayerful thought about this scripture too. And she's going to share with us some things about the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God appears in the Old Testament under the Hebrew word ruach. 
in the New Testament under the Greek term pneuma, and a total of over 500 times the word appears. So it must be important. It was important enough to Jesus to issue it to his disciples. Tell us about it, Nancy. Okay. Um, most people know who God is. Most people know who Jesus Christ is. But not many understand what the Holy Spirit is. There's been faulty, faulty theology concerning the Holy Spirit. For example, the Holy Spirit is no longer viable in the church. The, the Holy Spirit only originated to help grow the early church, and it disappeared with the death of the last apostle. There's even divisions among churches today about whether the Holy Spirit still functions in the church or the Holy Spirit is no longer needed, therefore is extinct in the church. However, scripture informs us, John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he, God, may be with you forever. People are afraid of the Holy Spirit. It takes us out of our comfort zone. When we hear others talking about their spiritual, emotional experiences, uh, it sort of rubs us the wrong way a lot of times. We're cynical and suspect when we hear people say, oh, God spoke to me, or God told me. Speaking in tongues is something that like, is so foreign that happened you know, 2,000 years ago, but doesn't happen anymore. Or even some people are very skeptical about miracles and healing being able to happen. Some people think of this kind of speak as BS, spiritual BS, for, for, um, to show others how pious they are. However, scripture informs us. John says, my sheep hear my voice. And Paul says, those led by the Spirit are children of God. Who or what is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the gift of God's presence inside of us. It's not a ghost. It's not something to fear. It is a gift from God that should inspire awe in us, gratitude, and humility. The Holy Spirit has all the characteristics of God and all the characteristics of Jesus Christ. And the fact that God loves us so much that he gifted us with this spirit never to leave us on our own, to navigate our way through this life by ourselves. If the Holy Spirit is around, what does he do? Well, the Holy Spirit rejuvenates our, not, our minds by helping us to know and understand God's word. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be bold witnesses for God. The Holy Spirit unites people in love, and the Holy Spirit motivates us to service in ministry. The Spirit produces fruit in us as evidence of his work and presence inside of us. Well, how do we get this Holy Spirit to be active in our own lives? Well, first of all, I want to say, whoever believes in God has the Holy Spirit already. However, for the Holy Spirit, needs our cooperation to become active inside of us. We must desire and ask God for the Holy Spirit. Um, giving our consent to the Holy Spirit to work in every aspect of her life. I read something that said, when you ask to get more of the Holy Spirit, it's not that we get more of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit gets more of us. Um, we have to be willing to trust the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have to trust his guidance by following through on what he shows us and what he tells us. Um, we have to be confident that the Holy Spirit will never give us direction or guidance contrary to the truth we find in the scriptures. And I hope that sheds a little light for you on who and what the Holy Spirit is and how he lives in our lives. Thank you. We look at this and, and integrate what Nancy just shared. and She's going to share another personal story count in a few moments. One of the things that when Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit, the next step he takes is to commission them to do something, to make a difference, to go out and get out from behind the locked doors. He left the decision up to them when to unlock the door. He didn't unlock it for them. 
Humans have to make that decision. Whatever the door is in your life, you have to decide when and where you're going, and also why you're going to unlock that door. Because if you look a little further, if you get it into the book of Acts, chapter 5, you find that these disciples who were terrified and locked up in a room are now basically just so bold that even when the authorities tell them to shut up, they won't do it. This is the beginning of persecution when those terrified followers of Jesus are now totally committed, totally focused. And they teach us a very important truth. And that is being a follower of Jesus is no spectator sport. Think about that. It's no spectator sport. You become the reflection of Jesus. So Nancy, share us with us, if you would, your personal experience with your daughter. Um, years ago, when Ed was still in the Navy, um, one of his duty stations, he was stationed with a uh, CB battalion, and he used to have to go away on deployments. And at that time, we were in Mississippi, and our girls were about three or four years old, and we really hadn't been going to church at that time. We were not churchgoers. But he was gone for nine months and came back, and I had decided that I wanted to start going back to church, that I wanted to take the kids to go back to church. So we went back to church for the kids, or so I thought. I hadn't realized that this need or desire to go back to church was God drawing me to him. I guess at that point I was open and ready to heed the motivation, unaware that it was God initiated and not totally my idea. The first time we attended church, I told the girls that we were going to Jesus's or God's house. We took our seats in the Catholic church, and my daughter Christy stood up on the pew and was looking all around like this. And I asked her, what are you looking for, Christy? She said, Mom, is Jesus here yet? I explained that we couldn't actually see him. He was invisible, but that he was there. But as I looked around the church, I sort of noticed how people were talking and yelling at their kids or catching a few winks before the service started. And at that moment, in my mind, I had this image that Jesus was present, walking among the people, touching some on the shoulder, smiling at others, but went totally unnoticed. People were busy talking, children were squirming around, and others were warning yawning or perhaps thinking about their to-do list that they had to do after church. I had this realization that unless I focused on Jesus, I would not know that he was there with me. I thought about how sometimes I could be standing next to someone I knew in the bookstore or the grocery store, but I was not aware of them because my focus was on something else. And I realized that it's important to focus on God by anticipating and expecting to somehow encounter the risen Lord during the church service. And that is an essential component for a meaningful church experience. Without that focus, I'm merely exercising a duty of attending church and participating in a social activity. The other week when Nancy and I were getting together to talk, um, I shared with her the fact that I had pretty much figured this sermon out, because I have a lot of time since Barton asked me months ago, <laughs> and uh, I had it all pretty well figured out, and that one day I was washing dishes. Yeah, I do wash dishes. Uh, not often, but once in a while. <laughs> uh, and all of a sudden this thing came to me that changed this whole sermon, or this whole scripture. You know, it says that the first week Thomas wasn't there, I want to suggest to you something sort of revolutionary. Yes, Thomas was. Thomas was there the first week, but he wasn't there. You ever had those experiences? Your mind's on something else, the golf game, your grocery list, who's coming over for supper, you know, the letter you got to send, whatever it is, Thomas might have been there but not really focused. 
Or he may have been there and no one noticed. The disciples said later on, did you see Thomas? No, I didn't see him. Did you see him? No, I didn't see him either. That happens to you maybe in church once in a while. You know, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are the body of Christ. And we here at Windermere talk about this being sanctuary, a safe place to be real, to be open, to be your real self. Well, if you haven't seen or experienced that body of Christ in your life, then I suggest that you stick your finger in it to find out, thrust your hand in it to find out. In fact, if you want to, jump, do the hokey pokey, whatever, get your whole self into it and find out if we are really the body of Christ. That will happen for you if you focus and commit yourself to that experience and that realization. One of the best ways of doing that is by partaking a communion together. In the United Church of Christ, we observe or celebrate open communion. Everyone's welcome. This is not David Hausley's table. It's not Barton's table. It's not even Windermere's table. This is the Lord's table. And we're going to do a little different. We, when we normally take communion, we have the cup and the bowl of bread. And we take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup. Well, you're going to be given a dip, another, another choice. I'm asking Todd to come up, Todd the Flame. He's going to join us also. We're going to have two choices of bread. You can either take the bread out of the bowl or tear a piece off of the loaf that Todd's going to hold. We don't usually use the loaf, but we're going to do it this morning. Do one or the other. If you use the bread off the, off the loaf, don't dunk the whole thing in and sop up all the juice. <laughs> okay. So 